Appreciate the song that was sung about the Lamb of God. And uh, we're going to spend our time in a number of verses looking at the Lamb of God, beholding the Lamb of God from Genesis to Revelation, and then especially magnified in the book of Revelation. I want you to know that I am fully aware that I have preached on this theme a number of times in recent years. And there's a reason. I know of no greater call upon our lives than that we behold the Lamb of God. Secondly, I know of no greater need that we as Christians have than to behold the Lamb of God. Beholding him, we're transformed into his likeness. And so we will be spending most of our time, which is quite usual from the pulpit here, regardless of who's preaching, looking at the Word of God, not our thoughts about the Word of God. Uh, if our thoughts about the Word of God are on target, then that's a good thing. But it is always a good thing when we come to the pulpit or we're teaching in a class that the Word of God is lifted up above everything. And our passion is to say, Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? What do you want to manifest through me from this time together? Father, we pray for the blessed minister of the Spirit of God. Thank you for giving us the Spirit-given Word of God, breathed out through a variety of your servants, preserved for us to this day. And now, Holy Spirit, be our master teacher. We want to observe, we want to behold, we want to glory in the Lamb of God. Quicken us in this time together. And for this we pray in Jesus' name. We're going to follow through on the first part of from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, we could spend hours here. Maybe we should come back and spend more time later. But I give it to you this way. I hope you will go home, that you'll keep this outline, and that you'll look up these scriptures and do some study on your own and intensify the opportunity and the privilege to see the master theme of the Bible, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So we start all the way back, and we could start before Abel. We could start with Adam and Eve in the garden, and their fig leaves didn't work. Uh, there has to be a provision from God. God provided for them. And with Abel, there's a clear picture here of the necessity of the Lamb of God. And we know from the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse, tw tw verse 5, that the reason why Abel came to God with a blood sacrifice was because he was living by faith. Living, to live by faith is to live not only believing the Word of God, but acting upon the Word of God. And so he offered a lamb by faith. It had already been revealed that ho an unholy person can only relate to a holy God by means of a blood sacrifice, the substitutionary atonement of the Lamb. So, true worship must begin by revelation from God. We don't come together and point a committee and say, well, I'd like to worship God this way. Well, I would like to worship God this way. We live by revelation. God has given us revelation, and he gives the Holy Spirit to help us to apply it to our lives. And so, when the Bible says that the life is in the blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Abel's, test, Abel's offering tells us that he was conscious of being a sinner and he knew that he could not relate to God based on anything that he did. Uh, I hope you've had that experience. And if you have, there's something else we need to know. 
flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. It's a grace thing. Uh, Peter made a tremendous confession of faith. And the Lord said, Peter, that was not your idea. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. What an amazing thing that God would reveal things to us. What a precious thing. Have you had that experience in coming to faith in Christ because God, by his Holy Spirit, awakened you to your sin and awakened you to the beauty of Jesus, the Lamb of God, and you found yourself crying out, Oh, Lord God, forgive me, save me. And in your daily life, it should be a continual living in the presence of the Lord and rejoicing in the Lamb. Of course, Cain's offering had nothing that confessed sin or need of forgiveness. Cain and Abel were both sinful, hell-deserving ones. They both came to worship. Cain was not an atheist. There are many people today who have come to church houses and to uh, all sorts of buildings, or, or they're out in the woods, or they're fishing on the lake, and they're having their time with God. And uh, he's just, Cain and a lot of other people just want to do things their way. It's normal. But the fruit of his vegetable and off, his vegetable and fruit offering was a denial of his great need. Are you hoping to get into heaven based on your good works, your good practices, or by the blood of the Lamb? Both came to worship. Both gave offerings. What offering do I bring today? In what am I resting? Am I resting in the Lamb of God? The very thought that I could rest in the Lamb of God, the doing and the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, is this just old hat to me? Is this something that thrills my soul? In Genesis 22, we see God's provision of a lamb. Uh, Abraham offering a lamb in the place of his son Isaac, except that, of course, he didn't have a lamb. Isaac says, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Abraham said, son, God will provide. Abraham trusted God to provide the right sacrifice. And here we are all these years later, and we are still in need of a suitable sacrifice in order to relate to a holy God. Uh, we cannot provide a suitable offering. And so when Abraham was about to slay his son, God stayed his hand and provided a sacrifice. There's a great picture, prophetic vision of God's provision of Jesus, the Lamb of God. In Exodus 12, there is a Passover lamb slain on the night of the Passover. Who, living in Egypt at that point in time, who were the sinners? When you say the Egyptians, they were sinners. Well, what about the Israelites? Every bit as bad sinners as anybody else. There's none righteous, no, not one. God in his sovereign grace chose to save the Israelites. And, but there had to be a lamb, a perfect lamb, had to be slain. And so when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Why should I let you into my heaven? If you were to receive that question today, I hope we would think about the hymn writer who got it right. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. What is, what is my testimony this morning? This is the most fundamental, the most important question that could ever come to your mind or to mine. Upon whose doing and dying am I resting? Of course, in Leviticus, the character of the lamb is emphasized over and over again. The lamb must be perfect. And of course, Jesus, the sinless son of God, fulfilled all of that. Of course, all of those pictures thus far, uh, and looking forward to Calvary, but thus far, none of them show specifically that God is talking about a person. In Isaiah 53, you learn without question that the lamb is a person. And so, 
those lambs that were slain earlier were pointing beyond themselves. And so here we see the lamb which God provided, would provide at that point, is a person. In 1 John, or in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 29, finally the prophesied lamb is come. John the Baptist sees Jesus and pointing to Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you here today and you've come to grips with the fact that you've sinned, you deserve hell, and God has shown you the Lamb of God? You say, I'm a Baptist. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Or I've got a better denomination. It doesn't matter what denomination. It's the Lamb. It's the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Look and live. And Christian, you say, well, this Lamb stuff, that's, uh, I dealt with that when I got saved. You think you're through with the Lamb? <laughs> if you're His, He ain't through with you. He's going to spend the rest of His life moving you along a path of conforming you and I into the image of His Son. So we're empowered for daily spiritual battles and one of the great tools of God to do this is that we behold the Lamb of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18, beholding him, we are metamorphosed, we are transformed into his likeness. You know, the sad reality is I can have a Bible reading habit or, or pick up a Bible and start reading. When we understand the message how can we do that? How can we read very far and not be thinking about the Lamb? Not be thinking about the fact that the whole revelation is showing the nature of who God is and who we are. And there's a problem and there's one solution. Behold the Lamb. So it should bring about in tremendous gratitude in our heart and direction to us. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, 3 and 4 speaks about looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In the earlier chapter, he says, we have this great cloud of witnesses before us. And he says, look to Jesus. And one of the things you see in the, in the book of Revelation is that you can look to the great cloud of witnesses that they prophesy of people that are, are coming. They're going to be martyrs and others who believe Jesus is worth living for, believe Jesus is worth dying for. And so we have a great cloud of witnesses in the past. We have Jesus Christ himself. We look through the lens of prophecy and see there are those who are coming after us. It's already been revealed that they think Jesus is worthy. How gracious of God in a world that is calling in so many directions and so many things to try to pull us aside and get us off balance. And we open the Bible and we have this great cloud of witnesses wherever you turn. And we see not only a positive of that, but we see a great cloud of witnesses of those who turned away or who refused or who rebelled. Uh, we need to be looking for these kind of specifics wherever we read in the Word of God. Now, number eight on that list is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. And here we're taken further. If we go through the details of those verses, you can see that every one of the revelations of the, of the Lamb of God that we've already covered, they are revealed in those verses. But something new is revealed. He tells us about the resurrection of the Lamb. And so then that obviously leads to the Revelation in chapter 5, where the, 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 the Lamb is now in heaven and enthroned and victorious, and he's working through his redeemed on earth. And in studying that this week, uh, there's a lot in the book of Revelation that People say, well, that doesn't relate to us because the church is going to already be out. Okay, let's assume that that's true. So what we have here from Genesis to the end of Revelation up until whenever the time of the Great Tribulation is, 
up until that time, all who are redeemed would be, could be called pre-Great Tribulation saints. Millions have died throughout the centuries, uh, and many who have taught uh, about prophecy and so forth the last 50 years that, that I've been around so far as studying Scripture, they've come and gone and died, and if they were believers, they are among the pre-Great Tribulation saints. Then when we come to the Great Tribulation, as we saw last week, there's incredible good news. Multitudes of people during the Great Tribulation are redeemed. Now, if you want to divide it up, some are part of the church, some of this, some of that, uh, go ahead, that's fine. Do, people do it different ways, but what, here's what you can say about every one of them. They're, they're redeemed. And redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And there's only one way of salvation. Always has been. It doesn't change. People look forward to the Lamb coming and paying the sin price. We look back to the Lamb. And so, if you'll think about it, that might not fit into some of the prophecy uh, outlines that people have. But you look at it in the scripture, and most people, up until the Great Tribulation, suffer various amounts of tribulation, even right now. We know that. Have you looked at the news? Uh, if you get on uh, some of the uh, email lists of people who follow the account of people who are suffering for the gospel today, it's incredible what is happening. Probably Brother David here from Ethiopia could give you some first-hand information of what he is, has experienced or what some of his family has experienced uh, in his lifetime. Incredible suffering from Christians. We are, have been immune, we've been blessed. So we don't all have the same level of so far as suffering, the price we have to pay, uh, the privilege we have of suffering for Jesus Christ. Now, when it gets to the Great Tribulation Saints, same scenario, just the, bur the burners have been turned up. In this present life, uh, God's children are not the subject of God's wrath. They are the subject of man's wrath, and the subject of Satan's wrath and deceptions. And so it will be in that future era of the Great Tribulation. Those Tribulation Saints are not beat up by Jesus, their Lord and Master. They're with the Lamb. It's stated all through the Bible. And, and if you'll just read the Bible from the perspective of the Lamb and the redeemed, then you can see those first Christians who got the book of Revelation. And they say, wow, look what's coming. We thought we were persecuted greatly. Uh, we're missing this loved one and that loved one. And look what's coming. We don't know when it's coming, but down the way. There's going to be a people who probably suffer to more extremes than we've ever suffered. And that's not all. The Lord has opened the curtain and we see them with no regrets, no remorse, worshiping and serving Jesus for all eternity. You see, when you receive the Word of God, when you see the book of Revelation as it's designed to be, it is a great source of great comfort no matter what era of time you live in. And so, here is Jesus in chapter 5 and 6, in, in heaven, enthroned, working through the redeemed, moving events on the earth, and then it moves on to Revelation 21 and 22, where we come to the end of time as we know it, and the era of time as we experience it now. The Lamb is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The climax of all. Uh, what's the ultimate purpose of history? Uh, what's going to re be remembered for all eternity? The only thing left is the Lamb's bride. Those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from all eternity. And so Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the prayer that Jesus said, the model prayer, pray like this, thine is the kingdom. 
and thine is the power and thine is the glory forever and ever. And so we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth even as it is right now in heaven. God's will is being done now. He's not thwarted. He's not wringing his hands. But there's coming a day when his will will be done on earth in the same manner as it is done in heaven. And so in eternity, we find that all the redeemed shall serve him, see his face, reign with him. And that's one of the things that the, the Apostle John saw in the epistle to the John, uh, the epistle of John. Uh, we shall see him. And that's the great hope of every Christian. Truly, God has highly exalted the Lamb. Is he highly exalted in my life? If I reject him, the lamb of salvation, he becomes the lamb we face in wrath. So, we turn to the book of Revelation, and you can follow in your outline just the scriptures written out, and to get the full benefit of these, you'll have to add some verses to get some additional context, even as on the front page. But, um, we want to behold Jesus, the Lamb of God, as he is today, and as he will be, and for all eternity. And that's one of the things that the Revelation does for us. So look there in your page, it's probably page three, maybe, where we start uh, with number one, Revelation five, verse six. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent throughout all the earth. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who has prevailed. Satan doesn't win. Man doesn't win. There's no question that God will carry out all of his good purposes and work. That's one of the great messages of the book of Revelation. You, you don't see that when you look at the news. You read the newspaper, read the magazines. You wonder if God is even existing if you're just following that line of thinking. Then in Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, and when he had taken the book, four and twenty uh, four living creatures, uh, and the the four, the four living creatures and the twenty and four elders, that's a misprint there, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and the golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. God's prayers, whether you are this side of what is called the Great Tribulation or on the other side of Uh, it might not seem that way to us, but let's take God at his word. In chapter 5, verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and under the earth, does it, does it in the sea and all that is in them, heard our saying, but Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and upon the Lamb forever and ever. We know that no one is coming. You can turn the television on any station today. And you might have a religious program where someone is quoting this. But, and maybe in a good way. But just when you look at the news, no one is going to pick up, uh, go over to the microphone. Now we're going to turn the microphone over to so-and-so and give this report. And let's give blessing and honor and power to the Lamb. People are wanting God to change the world. We want him to keep our good American way of life. You read through the Bible. His agenda is not to save America. His agenda is to save the lost in people all over the world whose hearts right now will be beating and following along with this word, the, the, the various Psalms songs that are so that are set forth in the revelation it continues in chapter 6 verse 1 
And when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard it as a noise of thunder, one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. There are many things that are given from chapter 6 on. And the Spirit of God has said, Come and see. Now, sadly, people are afraid to do that. Sadly, people are confused in doing that. And it, I believe, becomes very simple when we, first of all, when you come and see through the rest of the Revelation, what is the primary thing you're going to see? The Lamb. Brother M.A. Thomas was right. Look for Jesus. In chapter 6, verse 16, and said to the mountains, these are the people who, they, 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 the, the, the Lord is coming back and uh, he's caused some disturbance in the heavenlies and something is going on and they know that they're facing judgment. And so they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Have you ever been in a field where there were lambs? Or in a barnyard where there were lambs? And someone said, beware of the wrath of the Lamb. Have you been in a barnyard or a field and there's a big, burly, several thousand pound bull, got long horns? And somebody says, beware of that bull. You have one emotional reaction to that versus another one if it's a lamb. Now, can a lamb or a goat come up behind you and and butt you in, in the rear and uh, send you for a few feet in the air and uh, you might even have to go to the hospital. I mean, that can happen. But lambs are gentle. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, all-powerful, all-knowing, created everything, sustains everything. Nothing was made with him, made but it was by him. He condescended or else we wouldn't have a savior. And so it almost seems out of character that there are people who are afraid of the lamb. Well, he is to be feared if you face him as your judge and not your savior. Now, praise again takes place in Revelation chapter 7 verse 10. And cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which is upon the throne and upon the Lamb. We pointed out last week that there's a tremendous emphasis in the book of Revelation about God being on his throne, the Lamb being on the throne. He's in charge. Uh, he's not up for a vote. He's not going to retire. He's not going to quit. Uh, he's in charge. That's good news. Verse 14, and, unto, and I said unto him, well, who are these people? You know. He said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. Some of the translations leave out the the, but most everybody says it's appropriate. These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. No other way to escape the Lamb in his wrath than to receive him in his mercy and resting in what he's provided for us in his shed blood. In verse 17, chapter 7, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water and shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know, we've had it quite good. We really have. Especially compared to others who've lived the same time period we've lived. 
Now, having said that, we do live in a fallen world and we've had our problems and our difficulties and we've had people who've been against us and uh, we may have been fired because of our convictions in Christ and so forth and so on. But uh, again, whether you're living pre-Great Tribulation or where you're living in the Great Tribulation, there's coming a day on the other side when you'll be comforted for all eternity. And no matter what you're going through here now, it becomes a non-issue. It's not even brought up. The glory of being in his presence and seeing his face is so great. You don't wear a tag say, oh, you, you came out before the great tribulation. I came out in the great tribulation. Boy, I really had faith. <laughs> none of that. Or none of a, well, my understanding of prophecy was right on target. Yours was it. I told you so. All, aren't you glad that's, that's going to be history? So start now beholding the Lamb of God. And you won't get sidetracked. See, none of that battling back and forth really helps you live the Christian life. But beholding the Lamb of God does. And Lord, however you work out all those details, fine. I'm going to behold you and walk with you. Because I'm looking forward to seeing you. In verse 17, the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. That's not yet, but it's coming. In chapter 12, and they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. Now again, many people would say all of these verses that you're reading don't relate to us. We're in the church age and we don't have to face this. Maybe we can learn some lessons from it, but I'm convinced with all my heart that those who first got this letter, who were in tribulation, when they read this, they were encouraged. When you stay with the Lamb, when you exalt the Lamb, when you rest in His blood, and you're not ashamed of it with your testimony, and you value Jesus Christ more than you value your life, and they overcame Him, the evil one, all the satanic forces, by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. In chapter 13, verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names, and uh, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that is, the Antichrist system, whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Well, boy, I'm so glad I'm not going to have to deal with the Antichrist. You don't understand the Bible. The ultimate big letter Antichrist is not here yet. Or if he is, he's not been revealed yet. But even in the New Testament era, many small letter Antichrists were rampant. First John. We, ha we live in the midst of a ungodly spiritual system that engulfs a world that is just as deadly as it will be when it's on steroids during the Great Tribulation. And so we had better focus on being close to the Lamb. Now in chapter 13, verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. One of the great weapons of the Antichrist system is counterfeits, false prophets. And even Paul said, it's no mystery if they turn themselves into angels of light. Are you and I flippant about spiritual warfare? Are you and I flippant 
about not really focusing on beholding the Lamb? Must not be. In chapter 14, verse 1, And I looked, and lo, the Lamb stood on Mount Zion with him, 144,000 having his Father's name written on their foreheads. This would focus, assuming this would be the same 144,000 mentioned earlier, to those whose uh, genetic, genetic background is, is Israelites or Jews. And they're with the Lamb. That's the factor. And in verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with woman, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes. Isn't that the mark of any Christian? I'm about to do something. I'm thinking about something. I'm making a choice. I'm being confronted with something. The mark of the Christian is, I'm following the Lamb. Whithersoever he goes. My attitudes, my attitude toward family members, my attitude toward someone in the church, my attitude toward someone that I work with. Am I following the Lamb? In verse 4, these are they redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. Then in chapter 14, verse 10, it speaks about those who have taken on, succumbed to the Antichrist system. And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is, this is not fiction. This is what's coming to those who reject the Lamb. There are those who in chapter 17 uh, make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb overcomes him. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. I don't care what era of time you live in, if you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, it is a sovereign work of God's grace, and you are the called, you're the chosen, and you're the faithful. It is totally wrong to go through the book of Revelation and separate out, well, this is a great tribulation, and never take up any connection of the great rejoicing of all the redeemed that come out of it and how they lived with a conscious awareness of walking with the Lamb, of being the called, the chosen, and the faithful. But again, that's not new. That's Old Testament salvation through grace, New Testament, all time, and then we're moving toward the climax of history. History is going somewhere. Well, what's, what's the year 2040 going to be like if the Lord hasn't come? I don't know, but it sort of looks like it might be different. <laughs> Things are moving pretty fast and in a lot of ways that, uh, ew. well, if that's to be, the Lord will be sufficient. He's always had a people. He's always redeeming those who he has set out to redeem. He's not going to lose any. And so, in uh, chapter 19, number 19, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Verse 9, and he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He says, these things are true. Revelation 21, 9, And there came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked to me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the Lamb's wife. And when you look at those verses, we should have printed verse 12 through 14. There are those, 
He's, show, he's going to show, here's the Lamb's wife made up of Old Testament saints represented by the 12 tribes of Israel, made up of New Testament saints represented by the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's it. You move into eternity, that's what's left. The whole purpose of this human experience here on earth is not to build some kingdom, Babel. Man's been trying to do it, never has worked. It ultimately falls, it ultimately comes under judgment because it does not value the Lamb. And there are many homes, there are many churches that are strangers to the Lamb today. And it's becoming more and more evident. In chapter 21, verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. 21, verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works of abomination, nor maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life, 22, verse 1, And he showed me a pure river, water of life, crystal is clear, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. 22, verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Obviously, the master theme of the Bible, and especially of the last book of the Bible, is the glorious triumph of Jesus the Lamb. Do you and I have an interest in that? Do we see the centrality of that? The more we behold Jesus the Lamb, you know what we will have? More affections for the Lamb, more astounding amazement of the Lamb, more worshiping the Lamb. You know what else we'll have? Sin will lose its attraction. When sin has attraction in my life and is, well, I'm really struggling with this sin. What's the root problem? The lamb is in a back room somewhere, or maybe not existent, if there's no power and no desire to overcome the sin of this world. When Jesus the lamb has our hearts, we also have a growing motivation and power and passion in worship and to function as his disciples and as soldiers of the cross. All the redeemed throughout all of the chapters in the book of Revelation, and especially those who are in that time period of, that is referred to as the Great Tribulation, they demonstrate a strong spirit of being a soldier of the cross, overcoming because of the Lamb, because of their testimony to the Lamb, because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the testimony to it, and because they value Jesus Christ more than anything. May the Lord work in each of our hearts to spend the rest of the days of our lives increasingly beholding the Lamb of God.